Good evening. May 20th, 2024, 7.04 p.m. Call the Planning Commission, Snoqualmie Planning Commission to order. And first I'll do the roll call. I am present, Luke Marusiak. Um, and I'll just go around the thing. Vice Chair Tessman. President. Uh, Commissioner Steve Smith. Don't see him. Yeah, Commissioner Kilkup's actually in the bullpen. So uh, it, it, you said that Commissioner Smith gave us a, uh, he's not going to be able to make it? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Kilkup is coming in. Commissioner Crone. Present. Mr. Lambert. Present. Okay. Are you promoting uh, Commissioner Kilcup? Okay. There we go. And Commissioner Kilcup? Has it. Excellent. Okay. And as uh, Commissioner Smith has given us uh, notice that he was going to make it, I move that we excuse Commissioner Smith. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Mr. Smith is excused. Are there any public comments for items not on the agenda? I don't see any in the and none present. Then we move on to approve the current agenda for May 20th as written. Can I get a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And uh, is approved. And um, do we miss an agenda item? Should we have the, uh, oh, there it's done. It's okay. Council liaison report, next agenda item. And we have Council Member Johnson. Greetings, Commissioner. Uh, we had a packed agenda at our last council meeting. Uh, first thing I wanted to tell you about is the mayor's uh, proposed non utility CIP for 2025 to 2030. Um, that uh, runs a grand total over the course of those years of <clears throat> around $60 million in various projects and programs over those five years uh, with matching sources. Um, the good news is that we've removed a couple of items. We removed the spray park and the all-inclusive playground because the all-inclusive playground is done. And the Sprague Park uh, will likely be completed this summer. Uh, last I heard, it was planned for early July. Uh, we'll see when exactly it lands, but uh, that's the last I heard for that one. Uh, the other item of note, of course, that uh, I'm sure everyone's interested in is the community center expansion. Uh, the last time I had looked before the mayor's uh, proposed CIP, it was sitting around $34 million. And I was getting really nervous. Uh, the current number is actually down uh, quite a bit from that, down at uh, 29 million. Uh, so uh, we'll we'll see how that goes. Uh, the main sources being from REIT and sales tax, along with a few other things uh, that are yet to be uh, decided. Uh, and as you could imagine, the council will have a tremendous amount of deliberation uh, over that particular item uh, before we either approve the CIP as it is uh, or approve any contracts, of course. Um, but I did want to just uh, highlight a couple of uh, concepts as we head into the CIP process. The first is that uh, the CIP is broken into two large categories, non-utility and utility. Uh, the mayor has so far uh, proposed a non-utility CIP. We'll get a proposal for a utility CIP at some point down the road. Um, and that covers uh, obviously soup, storm water, that sort of thing. Uh, so the non-utility CIP uh, is broken into two broad categories of projects and programs. Um, programs are things that are recurring items that we know we're gonna have to spend all the time, like uh, resurfacing streets. Every year we've got streets that at some point we'll need some work done on them. So we know that we're gonna have to spend that. Uh, we have the sidewalk replacement program uh, where uh, over time, sidewalks lift up because of tree movement or uh, because of uh, uh, things that happen to uh, the soils underneath, uh, expansion and thawing with the weather, et cetera. Uh, they can break. <laughs> so there are all kinds of reasons why we have these programs that do the things we know we have to do. Another example being a playground replacement. 
we know that our playgrounds get old and we have to replace them. And the example of a project would be like the River Trail project, uh, formerly known as the River Walk. We now call it the River Trail. Uh, that is a big project that uh, we're not going to be replacing anytime in the near future, uh, but it does not yet exist. At least most of it doesn't. Uh, we have a, a little tiny section uh, over by uh, the playground with the trains, River Riverview Park, I think it's called. Anyway, uh, that's an example of a project would be the River Trail project. Uh, projects are funded by, since they're big one-time-ish expenditures, they're funded mostly by one-time sources, uh, like grants are a good example of a one-time source. And then programs are funded by the most part by ongoing sources, like a gas tax, for example. We know we're going to be collecting a certain amount of tax on that, uh, so we put that money toward the things uh, that we can spend that money on, like street resurfacing. Uh, so that's kind of the, the main breakdown of the mayor's proposed uh, non-utility CIP for 2025 to 2030. Uh, we have not uh, adopted this as a council, as our ongoing CIP. Uh, it's just been introduced. Uh, and then the next thing I want to talk about is the 9-11 uh, uh, response system. Uh, we uh, um, adopted a new ordinance that uh, makes it a crime to... Uh, knowingly uh, report something to 911 that someone knows is not uh, an emergency. And especially if they aren't even really reporting anything, but rather just calling to uh, take up time on the 911 line. Uh, so that is uh, now a uh, uh, an issue that's been addressed. And then finally, uh, I wanted to mention something that staff brought to council of uh, King Street closure. The council uh, had a discussion about the idea of closing part of King Street, specifically between Railroad and Maple, uh, mostly during the summer, although there are alternatives that are on the table. We haven't officially said, yes, do that one. No, don't do that one. Uh, but there seemed to be some broad consensus around at least uh, trying to do a trial closure for the summer. Uh, when uh, the city tried a um, a more temporary street closure in the past. Uh, we found some limits to the success uh, of that. Um, people actually physically got out of their vehicles and moved barriers so that they could drive down the street, uh, which is not great. And if we do a temporary closure, then it is harder to have more non-movable barriers. Uh, other cities have done that in the past. Uh, our neighbor Issaquah uh, for a while had a uh, closure of Front Street and they had these large, basically immovable blocks, but they have more staff to move them around than we do. Um, so uh, if we were going to do it, it would have to most likely be a more long-term thing. And that could lead to a permanent closure of King Street uh, down the road, um, but we'll see. Uh, the purpose would be for to create uh, a broader event space since the actual uh, area around the gazebo for holding an event is actually kind of limited. There's a lot of landscaping there. Uh, it would make space for food trucks and it would reduce uh, pedestrian crossing, um, which uh, is deeply inhibited by having any kind of street crossing. Every time you have a street that intersects a sidewalk, you reduce the number of people who are willing to cross that street. So it uh, reduces that uh, issue and obviously reduces rail crossings, uh, which can uh, help with the flow of traffic. Uh, the downtown merchants have been so far uh, that uh, have been engaged, have been supportive of uh, this. Uh, one thing that, of course, someone might bring up is, well, when these food trucks compete with our uh, downtown restaurants and um, what uh, the consensus seems to be is that uh, they actually wouldn't because it's a different type of customer that's going to go to a food truck versus the kind of customer who's going to go to a sit-down restaurant. Uh, so they really wouldn't be competing with each other. Rather, uh, having the food trucks there as another option um, for uh, for sustenance uh, would just simply keep people uh, longer. Uh, you know, they um, grab some food, sit down at a bench somewhere, and uh, they're munching away, and then they go, hey, why don't we check out this store again? It just kind of keeps people here. Instead of jumping in their cars, they can go to the nearest uh, drive through um, So that was the logic behind that. Uh, again, we have not said, yes, do this thing. Uh, it's just something that's um, that's on the horizon, something that's being considered. But I wanted to let you know about it.
uh, that was uh, what I wanted to let you know about, uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions you folks might have. Excellent. Uh, I appreciate that, uh, Councilmember Johnson. Let me go around the table. I'm going to go in uh, backwards order. Uh, if I'm, from what I'm staring at here, uh, Commissioner Lambert. Any questions? Yeah, what's the uh, that's going to do to the traffic in downtown Snoqualmie when you shut down King Street? So the uh, data that we got from the uh, Community Development Department was that, uh, or I shouldn't call it data, the information we got from the Community Development Department was that uh, not a lot of uh, cars actually use uh, that street. There are some, of course, um, but it's not a heavily trafficked section of streets. Um, so it's not anticipated that, that would have a huge effect uh, as having folks either uh, turn it, what's the next one up? Is it Northern, I think? It's the next one up, or uh, anyway, uh, or river. Okay. Okay. Anything else, uh, Commissioner Lambert? Uh, no. Okay. Commissioner Crone? No comment. Thank you for the update. Commissioner Kilcup? I apologize. What were the, the potential dates for that closure? Uh, no specific dates, just broadly speaking, uh, it seemed to me that there was some broad consensus on council around a summer closure. Um, but yeah, not, not not a specific nailed down date and also not a yes, go ahead and do it. OK, no further questions for me then. OK, Vice Chair Tessman. None from me, thank you. OK, uh, for me, I, I think that King Street closure idea. I remember we talked about it since you were on the planning commission. I think it's a great idea in the summertime. I think um yeah you need more walking space than you have down there. So I think that's a good thing. So I hope um I hope you at least you get to trial it to see if that works out. And um uh, just a, a question I don't know if this came out in council or maybe I'll, I'll wait for the staff. Um the rails did that come up at all? Because that was a long time coming. It looks like that's finally under construction. Yep. I don't know what else to say other than yep it is. <laughs> Okay. I don't know if staff had anything else they want to mention about it. But yeah. Okay. No, that's good. That's good. All right. I have nothing else. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, I move that we approve the minutes dated May 6, 2024, as written. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Minutes for May 6 are approved. And then we move on to legislative policy items. Uh, agenda item number two, historic downtown retail code amendment recommendation and a multi-user rental plan amendment update. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for having me tonight. Uh, my name is Andrew Levins. I'm a land use planning consultant working with the city. I'm here tonight to talk to you about two items that moving forward, uh, based on the direction staff received at the last planning commission meeting, we think it makes the most sense to combine when we're discussing and considering. Uh, one of those items is the uh, mixed use final plan amendments to Snoqualmie Ridge one that we had previously discussed um, at, a, at a planning commission meeting two weeks ago. And then the other is the uh, downtown historic district retail overlay zone um, proposed um, use regulation modifications. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. So starting with what we had discussed previously, I just wanted to walk through it to um, identify the changes that we're proposing as a result of the input we received at the last meeting uh, previously. So uh, just a refresher on background, the reason these had been bifurcated before was because this mixed use final plan amendment is really just the procedural step um, that allows changes to be made in the Snoqualmie Ridge retail area. Um, however, we received feedback that without having a better idea of what those changes could end up being. Um, there's some understandable hesitancy 
surrounding um, approving or enabling those types of changes. So as a result, we're coming back to you today um, with the, these being combined, we are still proposing to remove um, mixed use final plan condition number four and number five. However, and these two are uh, proposed, still being proposed to be removed in order to allow the city to amend the development, the, the uh, Snoqualmie Municipal Code such that uh, those changes will apply to certain uses on the ridge. However, we've removed the recommendation based on feedback to amend the mixed use final plan to specify a specific zone in the existing zoning code with the thought that if that is something that is of concern, it could be addressed at a future time. Um, however, perhaps narrowing the scope of these amendments uh, makes them easier to, uh, to consider and make recommendations on in a way that addresses the issue that we're at, that, that uh, the Community Development Commission and the Economic Development, Community Development Committee and Economic Development Commission are uh, actually trying to address the issues they're actually trying to address. So that now moving forward to the second part of, uh, of the proposed amendments, this is the part that the Planning Commission um, want, had expressed wanting to understand more information about what's actually being proposed. What are the changes that are, we're really proposing? So background on um, these amendments, uh, in 2023, the EDC had sent a letter to the CD committee recommending some changes in the downtown historic district retail overlay zone. Those changes were that 100% um, of the storefronts along Railroad Avenue occupied by retail uses, 100% of the storefronts along Railroad Avenue should be occupied by retail uses, and this is an increase in the requirement from the current 75%. And that the time allowance to demonstrate a good faith effort to lease a tenant space to retail use should be 180 days, increased from the current requirement of 120 days. So the purposes of this requirement is of these two requirements are um, really to ensure that our downtown historic district is maintaining its walkable vibrancy and attracting uh, retail uses that um, benefit from co-locating next to each other and contribute to a vibrant, walkable retail district. So there's a requirement that 75% of the storefronts along Railroad Avenue Southeast be required by, by retail uses. If a landlord or property manager is unable to fill the space um, currently and it remains vacant for 120 days, they are permitted to apply to the city for a retail waiver that would allow that space to, to be filled with a non-retail commercial use that's consistent with the uh, underlying zone. So currently the downtown historic district along Railroad Avenue is right at that 75% ground floor uh, storefront requirement. Um, when this initially came to the EDC, they did not have the chance to make a formal recommendation. And so the CD committee remanded this back to the EDC. During that time, uh, the city conducted public outreach with both the Downtown Business Association, Merchants Association and the Ridge Merchants Association and um, was running these suggestions by them, trying to get uh, more feedback from stakeholders, key stakeholders in the area as to what they would really like to see, what they think is appropriate for this area. Um, as a result of that outreach, the city, the city staff uh, determined that most of the stakeholders in this area are very comfortable with the 75% minimum requirement. In fact, the majority of them wanted to see 100, a 100% uh, requirement. This was consistent with what had initially been recommended by the Economic Development Committee, however, or Commission, however, the CD committee indicated that they thought that was too high. Um, another, another aspect that we received a lot of feedback on was the 180 day requirement. Again, um, many of the merchants felt like 180 days should be was 
potentially even too low. Many of them supported the 180 day uh, requirement, but um, ultimately as a result of that outreach uh, staff or the EDC uh, formulated recommendation that would modify this from the recommending modifying from the existing requirements. So table one in, on page six of your agenda packet uh, walks you through what the existing requirements are and how they apply to the two different retail zones, walkable retail districts in Snoqualmie. So discussing the downtown overlay zone along Railroad Avenue specifically, there's a 75% minimum retail requirement for ground floor tenant spaces. There's also 120 day minimum vacancy period required in order to um, apply for a waiver from the retail use requirement. On Snoqualmie Ridge, there is no minimum uh, retail requirement. However, at the key corner tenant spaces um, that are identified in, in this memo, which are Center Boulevard and Ridge Street, Center Boulevard and Mayron, Center Boulevard and Kinsey Street, those all are subject to this retail uh, use requirement. So while the overall ridge does not have a minimum retail ground floor use requirement, those uh, tenant spaces facing those three, three intersections do. The other aspect of this that applies to the ridge is the 120 day vacancy period requirement. Moving forward to uh, what staff recommended based on outreach and what the EDC has ultimately uh, recommended as a result uh, is table two on page seven. So the EDC recommended expanding the ground floor retail use requirement to encompass not just Railroad Avenue where it currently exists, but also Falls Avenue. Uh, this was based on stakeholder feedback from the Downtown Merchants Association. And while this recommendation was made, there was no specific extent that was recommended. So the precise boundary of where that requirement would apply still needs to be studied by staff. Uh, however, it is a part of the EDC recommendation and we're presenting it to you as a result tonight. Uh, additionally, downtown, the minimum ground floor user requirement now on Railroad Avenue and Falls Avenue uh, is proposed to be 90%. And the minimum time required for vacancy is, repos is proposed to be 180 days before a, a property manager can apply for a, a waiver from the retail use requirement. Um, similarly, on Snoqualmie Ridge in the neighborhood center, just at those key corner tenant spaces, the um, Minimum vacancy period is proposed to be increased to 180 days. However, in order to enable this 180 day uh, change up from the 120 days that it currently is, the mixed use final plan amendments that we started with tonight and that we had also introduced to you at the previous meeting, those must be passed in order to enable a change that would allow this uh, minimum vacancy requirement to, to be increased. If that is not ultimately passed, this will remain at 120 days, even if this portion, um, even if the downtown historic retail overlay zone amendment is passed, it will only apply with the, upon the ridge if uh, the mixed use final plan amendments are, uh, are also passed. Can I ask a, a, a question, and maybe it's obvious, but why why have any days at all? I mean, why not just say, no, you're not going to do, I don't know, tort, lawyer, ter, tort lawyers or real estate. It has to be retail. I mean, wh why do you have to give uh, a day limit? So um, theoretically, there's no, no reason aside from uh, based on the based on what the CD committee had indicated um, as I, I, I was not present for those meetings, but I imagine it has to be with a property rights discussion at a certain point. Um, the EDC 
also concurred that uh, because some re some downtown merchants felt that a year would be a more appropriate amount of time. The EDC felt that from a landlord's perspective, that could potentially be too long and it would could result in raising rents on all downtown merchants if these landlords now were could worry that their space would have to remain vacant for up to a year before they could fill it if they can't find a retail tenant. Okay. Um, just one moment, uh, Councilmember Johnson wants to make a comment. Yeah, I just want to mention something on that as well as um, <clears throat> that uh, it is possible that there could be some sort of economic collapse where there just literally is no interest in retail in uh, some part of the city. Uh, every storefront is vacant, uh, rents are through the floor, and they just can't fill anything with retail. Um, but there are plenty of other things that are interested in coming in, so at least give sort of like the okay. We'd rather not have empty storefronts, even in a catastrophe. <laughs> um, it'd be better to fill them with something. And this gives the option in that case that, you know, if things truly are bad and it is dem demonstrably so, uh, then, okay, maybe they can fill it with something else. I think that's the other reason. Okay. Thank you. I see uh, hands up. So let's uh, continue the discussion. Uh, Vice Chair Tessman. Thanks. Uh, maybe two questions. Uh, the easiest one was we look at this, <clears throat> excuse me, we look at this 75% and propose 90%. I know that applies to storefronts, but what does that mean in, in terms of like, no kidding, like like how many storefronts are in downtown Snoqualmie? How many total storefronts are on the ridge? So that I have a sense of, okay, well, if 10% wouldn't be retail uses, that equates to five of the storefronts on on center or something like that. So I just throw that question out there because I'm curious, don't need an immediate answer, but then sure. before, mostly for, so I don't forget uh, the second one was, and this kind of goes into to chair's question, uh, but what do what do the cities around us do? Is it is it 180 days? Is it a year for them? Is there no limit applied because it's simply just retail? I'm just curious what the other cities do. So for your first question, um, I'm sorry, I don't have the number of retail storefronts off the top of my head in downtown Snoqualmie. Maybe somebody in the chambers might have the answer to that question, but I believe it's in the mid to mid twenties. Um, obviously if Falls Avenue was also incorporated into the uh, retail overlay district zone, that percentage could change based on the number of ground floor storefronts that are along Falls Avenue. Um, for the Snoqualmie Ridge Neighborhood Center, you're really only, a, this requirement really only applies to the to the corner retail spaces. So at most you're really looking at, uh, because it's three intersections and four corners on each intersection, you're looking at around 12 retail tenant spaces. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. And then do you have a sense on the other on what the other cities do for the uh uh time allowance? You know, I'm sorry I don't. I can that's something that uh we can do more research on and and um and uh come back with more info information. But I can say that uh you know as a city, uh Snoqualmie is somewhat unique in that it's retained its downtown retail center. Um pretty well and a lot of places don't have that that type those types of facilities and as a result don't have these types of requirements or uh, we'll do more research and include that information and in our findings in our next report to the planning commission okay. yeah please thank you and i think it would be pretty enlightening to know particularly issaquah and north bend uh, they're the most analogous so thank you and uh Thank you. We have two more hands up. I'm going to go in the order that they were up or I've seen them. Commissioner Kilko. Yes. Um, I still have a question on why on Snow no, sorry, Snoqualmie Ridge, is it corner spaces only? Maybe if you could explain that to me. Sure. So um, in the Snoqualmie Ridge one development standards, which is one of the documents that governs how development occurs on the ridge. The other one is the mixed use final plan. 
um, the development standards specified that this requirement that refers back to the historic district retail overlay zone, like the number of or the types of uses that are allowed, uh, the development standards refer back to that. And as a result, because they only specify those three intersections, um, that's the only part of the ridge that this requirement applies to. Now, if that's something the planning commission is interested in uh, discussing, potentially expanding that requirement or modifying it, that's also something that we uh, we can do as part of this effort. Yeah, I would support that. Um for it for being all retail spaces the other um i just wanted to voice my recommendation i like one year um in in the world of commercial real estate that is like a minute um and to be i understand that that creates um an additional hardship for the landlords but that's also the business they're in so um I guess I would say, you know, toughen up a little. And uh, in terms of there being some kind of massive economic um, fall, I, that is not as concerning to me because it's, I mean, unless we're all obliterated, we can make modifications at that time. I don't want to, um, I don't want to go to the lowest common denominator and assume that the worst thing possible is going to happen and that we will become unable to solve that problem. So I just wanted to state my opinion on that. Um, one thing that I did want to recommend is um, I would like to see for what we're putting together for the Ridge to be for all the retail spaces. Um, I do, I can see a situation where 90% is more reasonable. Um, however, I would want to see a hundred percent and um uh, but something else just to put out there for the other commissioners here is in addition to the actual use that's going into the space, um, there may be other things that we can put in terms of requirements to help the space seem more animated, even if it is of more of a daytime use only space um, with regards to visibility on the windows and lighting and different things that help it still feel like a safe contiguous part of um, of the downtown uh, setting for everyone and potentially creating like no contiguous spaces could be non-retail uses um, and or some kind of lineal feet requirement. That's all. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, before I jump in there, um... Commissioner Lambert, did you have a comment? Uh, Commissioner Kilcup uh, beat me to it. I was going to ask why just corner stores. Is that all you guys care about up there? Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to <laughs> yeah, just to add to that, I mean, I, I think what we could do is just put a percentage on there, um, similar to what they're doing with historic downtown. Councilmember uh, Johnson. Uh I my understanding of the reason why only corner stores is because that's the way that it was when it was originally written. Uh, I don't know if anyone is specifically hanging on to that right now, but that I believe would be the historical reason why it was only the uh, corner retail. Okay. So um, but just hold on a second, Commissioner. Yeah, so I'm, again, I asked the question on the 180 days. I agree with Commissioner Kilcup. I mean, I wonder why we have to give a limit at all because waiting four months might be hard, waiting six months a little bit harder, but I mean, I mean, still the landlord could wait his house. So I think a year if it's in our purview to go do that, would say, no, we really want this to be retail. I mean, this isn't a waiting game or a waiver game. We really want this to be retail. And secondly, um, assuming, again, we'd, we'd have to have the conversation about getting rid of those two provisions that prevent change, uh, why don't we put a percent of like 90% on the ridge? And that way we're in alignment with historic and we're trying to preserve the retail we've got on the ridge as well. So that, um, yeah, that's, I think, what I'd like to see on that. Um, and understanding we need to get rid of those two items to allow us to make this change. Um, Commissioner Tessman. Yeah, and I don't know, maybe Mr. Levins knows, I hate to bring, uh, make Councilmember Johnson come back up, but to that last point that he addressed, I think that kind of solidifies in my mind, correct me if I'm wrong, so 
in order to make that change to the ridge to uh, apply the standard across storefronts and not just corner units, that would be an impetus for sure for amendments four and five, right? <clears throat> yeah, that's correct. Um, in order to, that's, yeah, I can't reword be, it any be, better than you said it. Because <laughs> the corner unit requirement is embedded in the final plan, right? In the development standards, that's, yes, that's correct. There's like the two documents, the final plan, the development standards. Um, we would need to make amendments to both in order to uh, modify that requirement. Okay, thank you. Good. Trisha Kilka? Uh, okay, sorry, I'm trying to remember what my thought was. Uh, so the other thought that I forgot to address um, was the idea that somehow this might become detrimental to the existing retailers. Um, I just very much want to disagree. I, I can understand that line of thinking. And at the same time, I think this would actually um, encourage the current landlords to keep current tenants um, and take good care of the businesses in place. So I just wanted to voice another opinion on the issue. Um, that I, I think it actually would be a very uh, bolstering effect for the existing merchants. Okay, so, so no, I totally agree, totally agree. So, so to summarize, Andrew, and again, I, I know that we have to address four and five to get there, but it looks like the Planning Commission, and I'll look for hands up if I'm wrong, are leaning towards a bigger number than 180 days, and so we're looking at a year, uh, and I even question why we have to end um, putting a percentage on the ridge to 90%. And um, to, to make that specific, would you say all um, retail tenant spaces facing Center Boulevard or just all retail uses or all commercial tenant spaces in the ridge? I, I, I'm open for discussion. Wait a minute, uh, Council Member uh, Johnson? Uh, yeah, I wanted to comment on the uh, 180 days versus some uh, other extended period of time is just um, that we didn't quite get to that section. It's a little bit further down the page, but that uh, at that point, it would be appealable to the recommendation first community development committee right. and then appealable from that to uh, wait. The waiver goes to the waiver uh, request goes to community development committee that could be appealed. That decision could be appealed to council. Um, so. Uh, at least current council seems very much opposed to the idea of uh, allowing non-retail space. So that's a nice fail safe. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, that could change at some point in the future. Um, but uh, yeah, just wanted to share that as well, that um, it's not that after the 180 days that automatically uh, a waiver is approved. Mm, no, good, good clarification. Appreciate that. And, and, uh, and also it's a committee of people that are directly accountable to the citizens of the city. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's that extra thing, uh, which is a change from what it currently is, which is one person uh, in the community development department. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that um, the concern of four and five was the vacuum. Now we're not talking about a vacuum. We're talking about getting rid of four or five to preserve uh, what we've got and perhaps even enhance it. Um, so on the original question, and just I'm going to circle back to uh, Commissioner Kokop, retail spaces, because I think on like the back sides, where um, that used to be a size where that the sushi shop went in, that wouldn't be just fronting Center Street, but I'd, I'd like that to you know stay retail, things like that. So um, I would say the uh, designated retail spaces, 90% of the designated retail spaces stay retail. And um, as a, similar to what you have downtown. So that would be uh, my recommendation. And let me circle around, uh, Commissioner Kilko. I agree. I think on Kinsey and Ridge, um, and I'm trying to think of any other, but basically all ground floor commercial space, uh, I think is designated retail currently. And so uphold that. So if office type uses want to go in, then there are second floor spaces available for them. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Okay. <laughs> If uh, if you don't mind, I would um, 
I would love to walk through the recommendation of the EDC so we can Please um, do. can kind of talk through um, what that is and then also get solicit your feedback on that as well. Um, so specifically, they recommended expanding the historic district overlay to Falls Avenue, increasing the re minimum retail use requirement to 90%, increasing the minimum time allowance to 180 days. It sounds like we're still discussing that one. Uh, another discussion point that they had, and this was also as a result of stakeholder feedback, was requiring that a vacant tenant space be advertised online in addition to other methods that are already listed in the code. Currently, that's not a requirement, and some merchants felt that um, landlords were gaming the system, so to speak, by not advertising their tenant space online. And then there was a staff suggestion that uh, the EDC examine the definition of retail uses, and the recommendation was that it be further defined to include to specify that the taxable sale of goods or merchandise must occur. Since the recommendation was made, um, staff's done a little more analysis on this item, and it appears that that's not actually going to be something that we can enforce. Um, so still, if there are other suggestions or methods by which the Planning Commission would like uh, staff to investigate, we're happy to do that. But this is unfortunately um, not going to be feasible. And then the last item, uh, as was already mentioned, currently retail waivers are reviewed by the community development director, and then that may be appealed to their decision, may be appealed to the planning commission. However, it's currently staff's suggestion that these retail waivers be approved by the council community development committee, and then that decision would be appealable to the whole city council. And the point of that is just to put those decisions in the hands of elected officials. Oh, that's good. So, yeah. Okay. Keep. Keep so going. that, so um, we've already kind of got into these next steps, but um, if we could get your feedback on um, the EDC recommendation and any other items you'd like us to explore, uh, we will do more research and come back to you with uh, a draft strikeout of the amendments, as well as SEPA and public hearing for the public hearing. And uh, we would appreciate it if the Planning Commission would make a motion to initiate a resolution of intention for staff to study these amendments to the municipal code. So yeah, before we get there, could you go through the uh, list of retail use examples, that matrix that you also attached? Yes. So moving down the list, hopefully that's large enough. Mm -hmm. um, these are all the types of retail uses that are currently allowed in the Stoquamie. And this is applicable, what's that? the commercial uses but not considered bona fide retail uses and as a result would not be allowed in uh, the districts that we are discussing mm -hmm. on the ground floor Councilmember yes, johnson uh yeah i had a question so is the issue that i'm just trying to understand the issue with defining retail is the issue that there isn't some broad uh sweeping definition for retail that is enforceable however we can um just looking at those lists there uh however we can pick certain types of stores like if you uh primarily sell this or if you primarily sell this or do this that that counts as retail but we can't give a broad sweeping kind of one liner of this is what a retail store is that's correct you can it's it's well within a city's purview to regulate land uses. Uh, however, it's much more difficult um, to regulate a specific regulate or require a specific activity as part of that use. Um, it's just how the zoning, how cities are enabled to use their zoning codes. Okay, and not to put too fine a point on it, but um, there is a. Uh, municipal code that prohib specifically prohibits cannabis shops in any of the retail spaces. So in case 
anybody was asking. That is in the code. Okay. We can expand upon that analysis as well in the um, in the next staff memo in the staff report. Okay. Mr. Kilko. Yes, I support this list. I think there are some potential exceptions that could be made off of the non-retail list, but I think that those could be then handled by the um, community director as well as the city council for, you know, whether or not it's a good fit. I think the biggest concern I have is, um, you know, what we're looking at, I think, where is it like Kinsey and Center Street and a medical type use went in and just shielded all the windows and it's just a dark corner. Um, so technically someone's paying rent, I think, but um, that is just so not what you want to see for the fabric of the community, especially on a key corner location. So um, I support what's listed in the retail column to be defined that way. Yeah, no agreed. Okay. So just to summarize before we make a motion here, um, what we're going to do is now that we have detail and I think we have a pretty strong opinion, um, the motion will include um, four and five, removing those so that we have some ability to do what we need to do. And then in addition to that, we move that we adopt the 90%, similar to what historic downtown is, that we do at least 180 days, but I'd actually like it longer if it's possible uh, to go up to a year. That'd be the the recommendation, obviously. Obviously, it's just a recommendation. And yeah, and we follow these uh, definitions as per the matrix so that things like, you know, architecture, law, and the medical, which we've already got one up there, that we we don't do that. And the, the idea with the year isn't, you know, isn't to prevent anything, but just to make a stand saying, look, this is retail. You know, don't, you know, as a landlord, which I understand many of them are not local, um, you know, don't play a waiting game four to six months and then, and then you know, go after a waiver. This is retail. Let's make it retail. So that's that's kind of where my mind is. Um, any comments from the Planning Commission before I make a, a motion? Uh, Commissioner Cook? Yeah, good. Uh I would also like to support what the uh, Economic Development Commission put in there in terms of like properly advertising online. Mm -hmm. uh, putting a sign in the window is not sufficient. And I do believe that is happening on some of the spaces. Okay. Yes, Councilor Johnson. Yeah, um, this is sort of a question to staff as well. Uh, under these revisions and that is left in place, uh, would there any be anything that would be construed as requiring that a waiver be approved if certain conditions are met? Or is it that you have to have at least met these conditions in order to be considered? Um, that is a good question. I don't have the answer off the top of my head, but I can review the code real quick and uh, hopefully hopefully get back to you real quick here. <laughs> if not, then certainly in the next staff memo. But my understanding would be it's, um, a it's not a you're not it's not a buy right. It's, it would not be a buy right requirement um, just because you your space has been vacant for X amount of days. It's still a council or a CD committee decision with a council appeal. Okay. So again, uh, I might be unique in this, but I don't look for 100% consensus on everything, but I think we've got a, um, let me propose a motion, see if I can get a second. So I move that uh, as recommended, um, we delete numbers four and five of the master use final plan. I also recommend that we adopt the 90% retail 
use uh, for historic that we adopted also for the retail use for the ridge that uh, we uh, advertise online as recommended by the EDC. And I'd like to propose that we increase from 180 days to 365. Understanding again, this is a recommendation. So, so that's the motion. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Not opposed. Okay. So, and again, it's it's a recommendation for the planning commission. If there's some uh, wrinkles or issues with that, I think it's a pretty strong statement of we'd really like to not just preserve but beef up our retail if at all possible. Okay. We'll have uh, we'll have a a more detailed report showing how this recommendation will look in the actual code itself. So um, there'll be another opportunity to discuss. Okay. All right. That was a good, that was a good agenda item. It was a good multi-meeting topic too. Okay. Anything else from uh, those two items? No, thank you. Thank you. Okay. At this point, we move on to agenda item number three, training historic preservation. Um, Director Arteche found a video that covers some of King County's historic preservation program. It's a bit of a longer video, um, so I'm going to take some liberties with skipping over some parts that aren't necessarily as applicable to the topics. Could, could you define, quantify longer? We uh, hours the here video is could... half an hour. Okay. Um, if you do want, like, I we can watch the whole thing. I was just going to skip over... Uh, a landmark designation process and then the nomination process were going to be the two big things I was going to skip over. Yeah, that's just objections. Feel free to skip over what you think we, we don't need to sit through. Okay, yeah. So I those parts just seem kind of not as applicable. <laughs> okay. Okay. Did you enable sound on the share? I thought there's a box you check when you share for sound. You may want to stop sharing and then try resharing again and see if there's a box to tick to share audio, computer audio. Um, okay, so Sarah Martin is going to be covering um, really the nuts and bolts, but I wanted to give a kind of a grand overview look at what landmark designation means uh, if you're in King County. And so this is kind of a broad overview. I, I actually found this slide in another one of our presentations, and I thought it really accurately captured um, we how we see think how we see landmarking in general is a big 
as a community gift, as, as a huge thing that people can do to recognize and honor and, and promote community pride in their communities. But a lot of people outside, when they approach it, get really nervous, whether they're landmark or they're property owners or they're people trying to undertake it. It can seem like a, a complicated process um, that can be really daunting and a little bit intimidating. So our goal today is to really kind of demystify what's involved. Um, and get people excited about doing this this kind of work and and promoting the historical historical properties in their in their communities. Um, just as an overview, I try to cover this almost every training I do because a lot of people don't know um, about this. So so how are how are historic resources protected? So the National Register of Historic Places is actually just an honorary designation. It doesn't offer any sort of protections, and most people don't know that. They get nervous that the if you put it on the National Register, they won't be able to do anything with their property or sell it, or I've heard all kinds of things, and that's actually not true. It's just a, a national recognition of the, his, of the history and the significance of your property. And the same is true for the Washington Heritage Register. That is honorary only. The only time the federal and the state kick in are when you're, when you're getting money from the federal government or from the state government. Those have their own compliance requirements, but it, on, a, on a local level, these are not regulatory um, systems. However, the local register, which is what we're going to be talking about today, which is King County and uh, the cities with whom we have an interlocal agreement. So you'll hear me refer to them as ILA cities. Those are the cities that have signed up for the county so we can partner together on doing preservation services for one reason or another. Usually it's because the city may not have the resources to, to do it entirely in-house and they want the partnership, but also we have a lot of technical expertise um, and experience doing this, and so they get to take advantage of our resources. So it's, it's a win-win because we get landmarks in the cities and then they get to use what we have to offer. Um, and those local registers are regulatory. This is where the land use uh, regulations come in. It's only on the local register. So it needs to be either an unincorporated King County or in a city with whom we have an ILA. So there are 39 cities in King County and 23 of them have ILAs with us. Um, and we frequently get inquiries from people who are in an, a city that doesn't have an agreement, interested in landmarking their property, and we encourage them to contact uh, their city officials and, and electeds to really start that ball rolling. And it's something we're constantly working on too, to, to promote preservation and get more agreements going. Um, but that's generally how that works. It's only regulatory on the local level. Um, since we're really kind of honing in on, on landmarking, this is probably one of the most common questions I get asked. It's, it's what's the process and how long does it take? Um, 90 days is a rough estimate from start to finish. Sarah is gonna go into these in a lot more detail, but I just wanna talk about the criteria because we also throw that word around a lot. So what the criteria are, are there categories of how we can determine the meaning of a place or its importance. Um, we have these five categories that we use in King County. We're looking actually at adding another and hope to by the end of the year. But these are the categories that it has to fit in. When you're making your significance argument, when you're putting that together, the story of the building together, and you're saying this is important and you're letting everybody know that it's important, you need to have one of these categories have it fit into the one of those categories. So A1 is a really common one. Uh, important historical events or patterns of history. So, for example, we just landmarked Coots Garage in Issaquah. It's a small commercial block that's uh, just outside the downtown. It's right on the edge of it, right by the Masonic Hall. It's now a it was a rogue brewery and now it's a, a movie house. And it's it's small, not hugely ornate, um, but it's very indicative of the time that it was built. When you look at it, you you have a sense that it was built some time ago, whether if you don't know anything about architectural history, you still have a sense that it is old and that has a particular representation as this as a commercial building, which pretty much everyone I think could recognize it as. You wouldn't mistake it for a house, for example. Um, you might not know all the details of how it came to be or what it was, but you have a sense of that it belongs to a particular era of the time uh, of the city. So you want to relate your argument to A1 if you're talking about that. This is related to a particular era in this city, like Issaquah, during the, the rise of the auto age. You're going to really build an argument around that A1. Uh, if you're looking at A2, you're looking at significant people, people that were really important on a local level, state level, or national level. 
uh, these people um, changed their community in some way. They led their community in some way. They they rebelled against their community in some way. It just it, they have to have some sort of uh, loud voice or uh, impact to really make the argument for significant people under A two. A three is kind of it's kind of the architectural component, but it also um, can can be applied to landscapes. So don't don't assume this is only building. It's not. We look at objects, we look at landscapes. I put a bridge up here for a reason. We look at infrastructure um, that has significance in itself, that has meaning, that has um, a particular role that it played in the community. A3 uh, really looks at the design and the, or the construction method. So it can be it can be a high style, a really ornate building, um, and or a really famous architect and be recognized for that. But it also can be a really unique log building that used a kind of um, joinery technique that you don't see anywhere else. That can be recognized under A3 because it's a unique construction method. Um, A4 is most typically used in archaeology or pre-contact archaeology. That's the stuff that's underground that offers more information than, than an intact public experience. Um, we don't see that one too often, but it's actually it's usually for most of our sites, you could probably make an argument that A4 is you often find historical archaeology around around historic sites in general. But to be designated under this, there really needs to be a lot, a lot there that could be uh, may yield information, I think is the code term for it. Um, there just needs to be something that is known to be there that, that can be useful in the future to be designated under A4. And A5 is is a particular architect or designer or builder, someone who has made a big um, contribution to the art and who this is a particular work that is notable that they have performed in, in that local community. So these are the you could call them categorical baskets like they're they're the centers of which your argument is going to be structured around to make the case that this should be designated as a landmark. Um, and it's really important that we do have these kind of standards or that they can like a lot of social history, they can seem a little squishy. Um, because we are doing a land use regulation, it's it's not a taking, but it is a it does restrict what the owners can do, um, and so we are very careful to make sure their arguments are very sound at every stage that we go through this, uh, that they understand that this is this will be a controlled um, building in the future, um, and so it isn't really key to make sure that our our arguments are clear and defensible along the way, and this is one of the ways that we do it. So um, what landmark designation does? So there's a kind of a lot of confusion around that. So I wanted to throw in a couple of slides about it. So on the, on the basic level, it provides regulatory protections through design review process. And what that is, is we have a, a nine member King County Commission that becomes a 10 member city commission with our city ILAs. They each city appoints their own member. And so whenever we see something in that city, it's a 10 person commission. Um, and that's an added step prior to the building permitting step. So you, it goes through design review. So the commission staff and the commission gets together and looks at what's being proposed and they decide uh, whether it's compatible with the historic character or not. Um, again, that's not we're not intending to, to keep any change from happening. Actually, it's in our criteria that we need to take into the owner owner into, needs into account. But our goal is to balance that um, the need for the property owner to have a, a building that works for them with the fact that this is a recognized historic research and it has a public benefit. So we are kind of balancing this too every time we look at a, a particular change to property. So it, that's a, a way to slow down the building process and to consider what, what the impacts might be. Um, another big one that, that Dana is going to talk about are available preservation incentives and technical assistance. Uh, we are really fortunate that we have uh, the Four Culture Landmarks Capital Grants and other grant programs that can really help landmark owners um, pay for some of the things that they need to their buildings, like a new roof, a new foundation, the brick and mortar work. Because we have a little extra regulation on what can and can't be done, um, this is a way to offset that and provide, provide some help uh, with getting those things done according to um, what, what we ask people to do. And it's again, for that public benefit, it's kind of that, way of recognizing that the building that you privately own is something that contributes to the community and we're willing to help you out with it. Um, and then technical assistance from our office. We are you know, frequently able to give really good direction on how to accomplish something, how to get it through the commission, how to, how to approach a particular issue or a problem that you're having or give you good resources and how to solve it. 
And that can be really helpful to have people to go to to talk to you about what's going on with your building or site. And then, you know, community pride is actually a huge, huge deal. Um, it heightens the public awareness of your building. It gives community recognition and it really, you become representative of, of a particular time or a particular community or a particular um, event. When you have a landmark, it just, it raises its people's awareness of it. It raises appreciation of it. It can actually have a pretty big impact. Just the fact that you are called out as a landmark. And what landmark destination does not do is something that I want to throw in here too. Uh, it, it doesn't freeze the building or site in time, as I've mentioned, I think a couple times now. It, the goal of design review is to allow compatible change. Um, we need buildings to be occupied and used to remain alive, and we all know that. But the idea is to, to try to protect the historical character or the historic character as much as we can while, while allowing the building to, to continue to remain alive and, and part of the. And also, and I know Sarah is going to go into this too, but the types of landmarks. So we have uh, King County or city landmarks, and those are the ones I've been really talking about during this um, meeting. The ones that have the regulatory protections, the design review process, and the preservation incentive uh, eligibility. But we do have another type of landmark, and it's called community landmark. And that is the same level as the National Register or the State Register. That's an honorary recognition. There's no pr protection in the code or incentive availability. But it can still be a really valuable thing. Uh, we have a whole district, like in Fall City, there's a residential uh, community landmark that people are there are very proud to be in, and they talk about it a lot. We have heritage corridors that are community landmarks that really kind of place an emphasis on the setting, and people take that into consideration when they're making changes. Um, this is mostly honorary and mostly just pride based, but it does have a pretty big impact and it can be a little bit more flexible than getting it through a regulatory uh, framework. So it's something that we're we're talking about more. We're using more. Um, it comes up if let's say something wouldn't be a good example would be the, the lunar rotors on the moon. Kent recently did a community landmark for them because they're not on the Earth, <laughs> so they they can't regulate them in any way. But they really wanted to highlight and document their connection to the fact that Kent was the facilities, Boeing facilities in Kent were hugely important in in creating these the rovers and what role they played in history. So they were able to get that recognition down. Uh, and community landmarking is, can be really valuable for that. Let's say if you have a building that that doesn't have a lot of integrity, it's been changed a lot, but it's actually been really a key part of your community, then designate it as a, as a community landmark and get that recognition. Um, it just is a much more flexible category that I think can be uh, used more. Uh, before I wrap up, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about, we have about 325 designated landmarks in King County. King County is roughly the size of Delaware. Alrighty, that's just about what I wanted to share with you, kind of just going over some of the criteria, which kind of just shows the different ways that things can be classified. Um, and then I think the emphasis on community landmarks was kind of interesting, especially because they just shouted out like Fall City, which I think most people would agree seems like a fairly historic town, even though the classification system is a little bit different. Um, yeah, so that's all that I had for that. Okay. Um, yeah, just, just one comment, and I don't know if we ever taped it, but when we had a Citizens Academy, there was a longtime resident, Dave Batty. Mm -hmm. Did you know what I'm talking about? He would tell stories, you know, stories about how in the 19th century, before anybody thought they could do it, they put hydroelectric in the Snoqualmie Falls. And it was one of the first long dis distance before the Grand Coulee Dam or anything. And that started it. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think 80 plus percent of Washington is hydro to this day. Um, or there was a, a tower where a guy's eyes were going bloodshot because he was looking for Japanese zeros going after the Puget Sound naval installations, right? And that was right here in Snoqualmie. Or the brothel that used to be in uh, what the Woodman was, things like that. Um, so my comment is that if you tell a story around your landmarks, it's a heck of a lot more entertaining than how most administrators talk about it. Because, um, yeah, and I think we've got an amazing story in Snoqualmie. And that was one thing that I think since uh, Dave Batty relocated, he located somewhere outside. And again, I don't know if we have that, but um, I, I think I think if. I think if we could tape that or even maybe invite him to come over and do that, because that story was invigorating. I mean, it just felt like, yeah, this is, we got to protect this town and protect what it stands for. 
Yeah, if I remember correctly, he actually provided uh, the department kind of like a picture book, like like historical, like historical picture book with like explanations a while ago. I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, I'm not sure the relationship that has been sustained with him, but he definitely has historically provided like a lot of information to this department. Yeah, and no, I think um, I think we ought to resurrect that, and quite frankly, construct a um, a, a narrative. I mean, there's, I mean, kids could do it as a project, or you know, Eagle Scout or something like that. But just a a narrative of the history of Snoqualmie, because quite frankly, since he left, um, it looks like we're going to lose it. We're going to lose our our history here, and it'd be very nice to uh, couple that with what we're trying to do with historic. Yes. Community Development Director Oteche. We do have the Dave Batty 101 Brief History of Snoqualmie online. Is it is it him talking or just the... Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, so we could share that or we could do another training session with that. Okay. Well, i tell you what, share the link initially because I'd like to take a look at it because um, the stories are, are just amazing. And um, no offense to our King County <laughs> Land, Landmark Commission, but um, you, you start going through the regulatory stuff to designate something landmark and it I, I think the stories get lost and i think i think they really that's what that's what that's what you're trying to defend when you defend the landmark is uh the stories that we've done over centuries agreed yeah just the part of the training is just to um, keep you tuned up a lot of new commissioners may not understand that the commission has a dual role um you know serving as the um not only the design review, but the historic design review. Um, and there's lots of information. So just any anything that you learn from these videos and future videos um, will just benefit the city of Snoqualmie as you, you know, just keep in mind that you're just keeping fresh and sharpening yeah, the sword. Yeah. An example for uh, some of the new commissioners. I know Vice Chair Tesla was here. I believe Commissioner Lambert was here. But uh, the rails, which is just now being built, um, came up for the historic design review and it was a very tasteful building but they had the stairwells covered with grain silos and again it was it was looking pretty good but we're like was there ever ever a grain silo anywhere anywhere around Okwami? and we couldn't find that there was so I think Chair Tesh was like well then, then it shouldn't be there it shouldn't be in our historic area so um, we sent them back to the drawing board at that point um, so yeah um, it's I agree it's a very important thing and for whatever reason there hasn't been a lot of builds and historic uh, design uh, reviews that we've done, but I think it's important when they come up to us. So you remember that, uh, Vice Chair Tessman? I sure do. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. All right. At this point, we move on to uh, items of planning and commissioner interest. So I'll... Uh, Again, I'm using it on reverse order as it's printed on the email. That's what I meant when I said reverse order. So I'm going to start with on my sheet here. Yeah. I'm going to start with Commissioner Lambert. Yeah. Um, real quick, across the uh, street from the uh, council building um, in Dune and Maple, that little goofy, we call it the ship's bow, we, there was a tree planted um, and a fenced end area. And we've commonly started referring to it as the weed garden. Um, is there any plan for maintenance on on this fenced-in piece of land? And then, in addition to that, the trees that were um, planted along Dune Avenue, and I think there was in the plans to maintain those for two years. The, the chip beds are turning to also weed gardens. And I think my some of my neighbors have decided to take matters into their own plant hands as far as uh, um, making them look uh, a lot nicer. I would, I'm, so I'm kind of curious, what's the plan for those? Can I just tell them to have at it and make them look nice in front of their houses as they see fit? Um, I think the most appropriate channel would be to just send me the parcel numbers and then I can let public works know that they need to get cracking on it. <laughs> um, if it's the city's responsibility, I think it's best that the city uh, work with cleaning it up. 
Okay. Um, I don't have a parcel number for the the ship's bow on Dune and Maple, but just go out front of the big giant windows, and you can see they're about three foot tall now. Yeah, I mean, Commissioner Lambert can't see it. I'm. Yep, you're looking at it, right there. <laughs> I'll just email you and confirm what you're speaking about because I don't honestly know specifically where you're talking. Okay. I can take a picture for you too. Okay. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sniper. Anything else? No. Commissioner Crown? I have nothing. Thank you. Commissioner Kilko? I'm just looking at the future agenda list and it looks like it says grizzly bears today. I'm curious what that's in reference to under staff chair comment items. I think the chair brought that up last time. Yeah, I was actually going to bring it up a second time today when it get to me. So I'll, okay. uh... <laughs> I'll wait for that anxiously. Um, no other questions for me. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Tessman? Uh No, I think that I had something and I forgot and it's going to bother me afterward, but I don't have anything right now. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. You got a minute. I mean, if you think about it, uh, Holly, before we adjourn. So, okay. So, first of all, um, kudos on the rails getting underway. That was that was a long time coming. So, uh, pretty excited about that to have some development in downtown that I think would be tasteful and it's going to be pretty cool. So, um, yeah, kudos for for that happening. Um, second, on the um, the Washington Fish and Wildlife plan to reintroduce grizzly bears into the cascades i would very much like to see as a as a formal request to them a written rationale of the risk of putting apex predators in the cascades and um and we're in a role worth asking and you know you have to do massive papers of a traffic analysis before you put it front up i certainly want to see in writing i don't want a hand waving while they're far away you don't need to worry about it because grizzly bears range i want to see their analysis that this is a good thing to do because they're going to take a bunch of them from montana and plop them in the cascades and say yes we have returned it to its natural state and i'm not sure that's a good idea so um i'd like to see how thorough they were on their risk analysis can i make that formal request as a chair of a plan commission i'm looking at the director <laughs> i uh, i don't know what you mean by nodding <laughs> Like, yes. Yes, formal request is heard and accepted. Okay. And we will put, uh, we'll get in contact with Fish and Wildlife. We have a contact person over there that okay. I'm I'm pretty sure she'll be able to help us. Yeah, I felt not, not you guys, but I think maybe Councilor Johnson or others were kind of laughing and waving. Yeah, yeah, it's no big deal, but but it is a big deal. Yeah, I remember I mean, hearing you mention it. So I put it on the future agenda list so we didn't lose track of it. Yeah, and if anybody looks at turn of the century stories about grizzly bears, um, there's a reason. There's a reason they're not around right now. So, um, yeah, I think uh, I'd, I hope they did their homework before they decided to do this. So, okay. One more request there. Good. Yeah. All right, um, Vice Chair Tessman, any uh, any light bulb go off? Uh, no, I mean I thought grizzly bears are friendly, uh, so I'm, I guess my mistake. I could, yeah, I could give you some old Fildon streams and stuff. It's yeah, a lot of interesting <laughs> stories about grizzly bears. To, to be fair, from what I've read though, uh, Seattle Times and the like, uh, I think their goal is to grow that population. I think to something only like fifty over the next hundred years. Um, but I hear you. What, what could possibly go wrong putting an apex predator back in the cascades, right? Yeah. Just don't go further than Lake Ross. It'll be all right. I just want to make sure that they've done a thorough risk analysis, and I want to see what they've done in writing. And yeah. uh, I think that's a fair thing as a rural community to ask for. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's actually, that's actually all I have. Let's go to the future agenda list.
Alrighty. So here's the list in its most updated form. I don't really have further comments. Um, I feel like we've brought up most of these topics. If that's the grizzle bears. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. It's actually why Grizz, Grizz, grizzly with a Y. Yeah, grizzle bears. Very they're cool. they're disheveled. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Very good. Okay. Are we going to be ready for the climate change intro in two weeks? It looks like that's the only agenda, and that's why I'm asking. We are still working through the city council on that topic. So there's a task order that likely will get signed on the 29th. Um, we did push it out as far as we could on the future agenda list, but it may get pushed out a little bit farther. So, Okay. So June 3rd and even the 17th are pretty light, if not agenda free. So we'll see if, um, I mean, let's, if we're good, if we don't need them, as planning commission meetings, let's see if we can determine that sooner rather than later, like by next week, so we can put the word out. Yep, that sounds good. Okay. If there's no uh, agenda contents, I'll make sure to reach out to everyone. Okay. It's just a meeting cancellation. No, okay. Not that we don't enjoy each other's company, but okay, very good. Very good. And then uh, as always, here's just the work program. Okay. What's the code amendment wireless? Refresh my memory on that. What's the code amendment I, supposed to be for wireless? I believe the code just needs to be updated in general. Uh, I is it Emily? Is it due to just like inconsistencies? There's just been uh, several FCC updates over the past seven years. Um, some of the de our definitions, I'm not quite sure exactly how up to date our code is. I'm just um, knowing that there were some recent amendments to the FCC that talked about um, substantial change, um, you know, provisions of 6409. So a lot of these things, we just need to double check and make sure that they're up, up to speed. Okay. Just making sure we're in compliance with the latest FCC. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. Anything else from staff? Okay. Let me thank the uh, planning commission. And uh, although he's not here, council member Johnson and uh, the staff, uh, Ashley and Community Development Director Arteche, very much for uh, helping us get through this, because uh, I think we did a lot of good work today, and I'm very happy with what we did today, so hopefully the commission feels the same. I think that was good to spend a little extra time on it and uh, weigh in. So thank you guys for that. Uh, with nothing else, then I'll move that we adjourn the meeting at 8.28 p.m. on May 20th, 2024. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Hi. Right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night.